Hi there, pre-calc. This is your second to the last lesson of this year and this quarter. Lesson four on higher order derivatives and tangent lines. A higher order derivative just refers to anything more than the first derivative. So for example, the second derivative, the third derivative, the fourth derivative. We actually already went over how to do that in lesson two. So we know how to find higher order derivatives. But today we're just going to talk about what are these higher order derivatives for? What are they useful for? What, what do they do? What are their applications? So one thing to keep in mind about a derivative is that it represents the rate of change of whatever it's a derivative of. So for example, the first derivative is the derivative of the original function. So it represents the rate of change of the original function. Now, the second derivative is the, uh, it represents the derivative of the first derivative, right? To get to the second derivative, all you do is you take the derivative, you have the first derivative and you take another derivative of that so the second derivative is the derivative or the rate of the first derivative. Now the third derivative represents the rate of change of the second derivative, and so on and so forth. So basically each derivative represents the rate of change of the derivative just before it. Okay. How do we apply this? Example one, we start out with f of x equals x to the fourth. Part A wants us to find all of the derivatives until the first one is zero. How many does it take? So let's see. Well, f prime, we're using the power rule to do the derivative. Remember, there's different rules, but this is the one that you're going to use for polynomials. And the only one we're going to do this year, the other ones you guys will do next year. So the 4 comes down, and you subtract 1 from the exponent, so it becomes 4x to the 3. So that's your f prime. That's your first order derivative, the first derivative. Now, the second derivative, which is, by the way, a higher order, meaning more than 1. The second derivative, you bring the 3 down, so 3 times 4 is 12, and then subtract 1 from the power, you get x squared then you can go on to the third derivative. So for that one, you bring the 2 down. So 2 times 12, that's 24x to the 1. But you don't need to write the 1, even though you could if you wanted to. Um, so bring the power down, multiply, and then subtract 1 from the exponent. That's what the power rule tells us. Now when we start to do the fourth derivative, I'm just going to write a little 4. I'm not going to do 4 dashes. It's too much. So I bring the 1 down and I say, okay, 1 times 24 is 24. And then technically it's x to the 0, but remember, x to the 0 is 1, so you don't actually need to write it. So think about like think about it this way, like 1x quote-unquote drops each time. So basically there's one less x every time. So the, when you had 1x, like now there's no x left at all because the 1x is gone. And then there actually is a fifth derivative as well. And if you try to do the fifth derivative, remember the derivative of any number is zero. And so if you were to try to do like, if you were to try to bring this x to the zero down, that zero times 24 would be zero, and then zero times anything is zero, so the fifth derivative would be zero. Now, technically, you could keep going. You could do the sixth derivative. Like, you could keep going with all the derivatives. They would just be zero from this point forward. So if I asked you what's the seventh derivative, what's the tenth derivative, you would say equal to zero. You wouldn't say it doesn't exist because it does. The derivative is zero. Um, you would just say the derivative is zero. So how many derivatives does it take to get to zero? Five of them. Five derivatives to get to zero. Okay, so now we are going to use um, this information up here to, to answer these questions. Is f of x increasing, decreasing, or neither at x equals negative 1? So the question is, which one of these derivatives do we use if we're looking at f of x? Well, remember, if we want to know about f of x, we need to look at its rate, 
or its derivative. So we just need to look at the first derivative, f prime. So we're doing f prime of negative 1. Now this notation is really important, so please, please, please make sure you use it. So you need to tell me which derivative you're doing, f prime, f double prime, f triple prime, like which one of these are you using? And then you need to plug in the number, so you need to show me how you're doing f prime of negative 1. Okay, so then you take the equation for f prime, um, which is this, and you plug negative 1 into that. So you go, okay, 4 times negative 1 to the third. So basically negative 1 becomes your x. Um, I'm going to make sure I put my negative 1 in parentheses so that I get my, um, my numbers correct, especially when I'm plugging this in the calculator. So negative 1 to the third is negative 1, and then times 4 is negative 4. So what does that mean? It means that f of x is decreasing because this is a negative number. If this was a positive number, I would say increasing. So basically, I'm going to justify is negative. So if it says, you know, justify, this is what you need to do. Negative 4 is negative, obviously. Therefore, or I could just say the word so, so I save some time. So f of x is decreasing. Okay, the next question asks, is the second derivative increasing, decreasing, or neither? So if I want to know what the second derivative is doing, I look at the derivative right after it. So if I want to do, um, if I want to know basically anything about the second derivative, right? If I want to know what the second derivative is doing, I need to look at the derivative right after it. So I'm basically looking at the rate of change of the second derivative, which is the third derivative. So basically I do f triple prime, and I'm doing it at 2. Um, so I take the triple prime um, equation, which is this one here, and I plug in 2 into that. So I do 24 times 2 to the 1, which just gives me 48. This is a positive number. So f double prime is increasing. When you write your explanation, make sure you like specify what exactly is increasing, because we have a lot of things going on in this problem. Is f of x increasing? Is f double prime increasing? Is f prime increasing? Which prime exactly is increasing or decreasing? And you can tell that by just reading the problem. So like it says here, the second derivative. So we are talking about the second derivative. Here it said f of x. So we were talking about f of x. Okay. Um, the next concept around this is concavity. So we know already the first derivative represents the rate of change. Now, the second derivative actually represents something else in the real world. It represents something called the concavity of a function. And a function can have one of three concavities. It can be concave up. And concave up looks like this. So basically, that's a function that's curving upwards. Now, the function can also be concave down. I'm sure you can guess what that could look like. So that's something like that. Or the function can have no concavity at all. If it has no concavity, then it's basically a straight line. Or maybe it's in the process of changing concavities at that point. So a function can have more than one concavity at different points. For example, you can have a function that looks like that. So as you can see, this region over here is concaving down. Um, I'm trying to draw something. OK, there you go. It's concaving down, so it looks kind of like this over here. But this region is concaving upwards, meaning it's curving upwards. So it looks more like this. Now, somewhere in between, maybe like right there, it's in the process of changing from down to up. 
at that very moment when it's changing, it's not going to have a concavity. It's going to be a concavity of zero. So no concavity could mean that maybe it's a straight line or maybe it's just in the process of changing from down to up or up to down. Now, a function can change concavity as many times as it wants. Like, you can have a function that looks like this. So first it's concave up, then it's concave down, then it's concave up, then it's concave down. So it can have multiple concavities over um, a period of time. It could also just have one concavity um, over the entire duration. It's totally up to how the function looks at that point. Now, D, E, and F are asking about the concavity of the function that we were just working with. Now, concavity is the second derivative, not the third, not the fourth, not the first, not the F, like just the second derivative straight up. So when we look at our previous function, um, here we go, our um, second derivative was this. It was 12x squared. So that's the only thing that we need to use when we're doing concavity here. Oops, sorry. So 12x squared. So our um, function that we're using right now is f double prime equals 12x squared. And so is f of x concave up or down or neither at negative 2? Well, we do f double prime of negative 2. So that gives us 12 negative 2 squared. Negative 2 squared is 4. And 4 times 12 is 48. Now, this is a positive number. So if it's a positive number, that means your graph is concave up. So I'm just going to put concave up. If you got a negative number, you would say concave down. If you got 0, you would say no concavity. All right, so f double prime of 0. What's f double prime of 0? You plug in 0 into that. So 12 times 0 squared. 0 squared is 0 times 12 is 0. So this has no concavity at that point. And then at 2, we've got 12 times 2 squared, which is 4 times 12, which is 48. So this is concave up again. The next application of derivatives that we will look at are tangent lines. A nonlinear polynomial, like the one shown here to the left, has an infinite number of tangent lines. So you could technically draw a different tangent line at every single point. Now, the derivative tells us the slope of the tangent line, but we can also find the full equation of the line, not just the slope, but the full equation, using something called the point-slope formula. The point-slope formula is this. y minus y0 equals m times x minus x0. There are several formats in which you can write a line. The most commonly known one is y equals mx plus b. Now, that actually ends up being slightly harder for us to use because the plus b is the y-intercept, and we don't know that. We only know the point on the function and the slope. That's why this format is called the point-slope format. And in fact, you can turn the point-slope format into the y-intercept format, and we'll look at how to do that in this lesson. It's not very hard at all. But it's easier, actually, to start with this format just simply because we don't know the b when we first start out. So before we can do any tangent lines, we need to be able to find a derivative. And to be able to find a derivative, we need to know what the function is when it's distributed out fully. So we're going to do that first. So when we distribute f of x fully, first we distribute the 4x into the x minus 3. So we end up with 4x squared minus 3 times 4x is 12x. And we're going to want to multiply that by 2 minus x. You can do your box method, whatever FOIL. I'm just going to do regular distribution. So 4x squared times 2 is 8x squared. 4x squared times negative x is negative 4x to the third. 12x times 2 is 24x, but there's a negative sign, so I'm going to keep it. And negative 12x times negative x is positive 
12x squared. Finally, it's useful to put these in the right order and to combine like terms. So the negative 4x cubed goes first, then the 12x squared and the 8x squared combine to make 20x squared. And finally, the minus 24x is at the end. The next step is to find the first derivative. So we use the power rule for that. We bring the 3 down. 3 times negative 4 is negative 12x squared. So you bring the 3 down and then subtract 1 from the exponent. For the next part, the 2 comes down. 2 times 20 is 40. And you subtract 1 from the exponent, so you just get x to the 1, but you can just write x. And then over here, this is like an x to the 1, so the 1 comes down, you get negative 24. And when you do x to the 0, because you subtract 1 from the exponent, you don't need to write x to the 0. So you can just leave it as minus 24. So now we have an equation for the f of x. This represents the y value. So remember that. That's how we're going to find the y naught or the y0. The f prime represents the slope. So when we look at this formula here, the m is represented by the f prime. So basically, your y0 is the f, and your m is your f prime. The x0 will always be given to you in the problem. So, part c. Find an equation for the tangent line at x equals 0. For the equation for the tangent line, which you still have on your paper, but I don't, so I'm going to write it up here, you basically need three things. You need the x sub 0, the y sub 0, and the m. Well, the x sub 0 is given to us. So the x sub 0 is 0. The y sub 0 is the f value. So remember, the y 0 is the f value. So y sub 0 is just f of 0. Now when we do f of 0, we can use either equation. It doesn't matter. You can use the one that was like right there, or you can use the one here. It really does not matter at all. You should get the same answer when you do it. And in fact, you see that when you plug in 0 into this, you just get 0. When you plug in 0 into that, 4 times 0 times blah, blah, blah is still 0. So basically, your f of 0 is 0. Now your m is the other thing you need. The m is the derivative, is the slope, right? m is the slope. The slope is the derivative. So basically, the f prime. So m is the f prime of 0. And for that one, you only have one option for the equation. You have to use this one here. So when you plug in 0 into that, what happens? Well, negative 12 times 0 is 0. 40 times 0 is 0 minus 24. So you end up with just negative 24. So now that you have your x, y, m, you can use this formula up here to just write the equation for the line. So y minus y sub 0 is 0 equals the m, which is negative 24, and then x minus x sub 0, which again is 0. When you use this formula, notice that the x and the y like stay x and y. Like they, This formula has to have some variables in it for it to actually be an equation for a line. So this is it. That's the end. That's all we have to do, except that it does ask us to draw the tangent line at this point. So where is 0, 0? 0, 0 is right there. And you can draw a tangent line by kind of staying close to the function and just drawing an approximate line at that point. Um, and you can see that line is going down pretty steeply, so it makes sense that the slope is negative 24. It's a negative number, it's kind of a big number, that's why it's pretty steep. All right, the tangent line um, for the next one, I believe your paper actually says at 1, so let's do that. Um, my apologies. So this is at x equals 1, so basically right here on the graph. Oops, cannot draw that. Okay. So this is x equals 1. So what would the tangent line be at that point? If we were to draw it, we would see something like that. So the function is going up, the tangent line is going up, um, but let's find the actual equation. So we need x, we need y, we need m. 
the x is given to us. The x is 1. The y is what you get when you plug in 1 into either this equation here or this equation here. It does not matter which one. I am going to use the first one. So 4 times 1 times 1 minus 3 times 2 minus 1. If you use the second equation um, from part A, you should get the same thing. So this is 4 times 1 is 4. 1 minus 3 is negative 2. So 4 times negative 2 is negative 8. And then 2 minus 1 is 1. So 1 min times negative 8 is negative 8. And that makes sense. If you can look at this function here, it's basically the y value is negative 8. So that makes sense. All right. And then the m is the slope formula. So for the slope formula, you have to use this for the m. So we use the f prime, basically. The m is the f prime. So we do negative 12 times 1 squared plus 40 times 1 minus 24. So you can use the calculator for that. It's fine. Um, so you get negative 12 plus 40 minus 24, and you should get 4. So your slope is 4. And that makes sense. This is going up, right? So the slope should be a positive number. It's not too steep, so it should be, you know, something reasonable like a 4. And then you can write that in this format up here to do the full equation for the full line. So y minus the y value, which is negative 8, equals m, which is 4, times x minus the x value, which is 1. Obviously, you can simplify that and make it y plus 8, because double negative means positive. So 4 times x minus 1. And this is the more simplified format. So you're plugging it into this equation up here. Uh, you're plugging in the y, the y0, the x0, and the m. And then the rest of it, you just literally follow that pattern. Now, I told you before that it's easy to convert from the point slope, which is this format, to y equals mx plus b format. So once you have the slope format, the regular um, point slope format, you can actually convert to y equals mx plus b format to find the y-intercept if for some reason you are asked to do that. And it's really simple. You basically have to distribute the point slope format. So it's asking part E, what is the y-intercept of this line in part D? Well, you can distribute. So you end up with y plus 8 equals, and then distribute. 4 times x is 4x. 4 times negative 1 is negative 4. Then you solve for the y. So you want to do minus 8 on both sides. So you get y equals 4x, and then negative 4 minus 8 is negative 12. Ta-da! This is mx plus b. The m is 4. The m is the number in front of the x, and the m is the slope. And that makes sense. This is 4. It should be 4. It should still be 4. But now we also know the b. And remember, the b represents the y-intercept. So the y-intercept here is negative 12. You should count the negative in front of this number. If there's a negative here, that's part of the b. So the y-intercept is negative 12. OK, we're going to do one more example. And this time, we're going to do it at 3. So the tangent line at 3, this is 3 right there. And the tangent line should look like this. So we do the x0, y0, m. The x0 is given. The y0 is, you plug in the formula, so 4 times 3 times 3 minus 3 times 2 minus 3. And this is all using, again, um, you can use either one. I'm just using the first part. But you can also use this. It doesn't matter. You should get the same thing. OK, so when I do that, this is a 12 times 0 times negative 1, which is going to give me 0. And that makes sense because, look, this is the y at that point. The y is 0. It's, it's not up and down at all. Now the m, you have to use the f prime formula. 
So again, going back, this is the M formula. So the M is the slope always and forever is the F prime. So whenever you're finding the M, use the F prime. So this is F prime at three. And we are going to plug in the three into that equation. So negative 12 times three squared plus 40 times three minus 24. And feel free to use your calculator here. So you have your three squared, which is nine times negative 12. So that would be negative 108 for this first part. And then plus uh, 40 times 3 is 120. So negative 108 plus 120. And then minus 24 is negative 12. So the slope is negative 12, which makes sense, right? It's going down. It's relatively steep. Um, and so because it's going down, I know the slope has to be negative. And I write the full formula. So y minus 0 equals m negative 12 x minus the x value here once again i am just following the pattern y minus y zero equals m times x minus x zero and for the last part of this problem i am going to find the y-intercept and the way to find the y-intercept again is to distribute this out so y minus 0 equals negative 12x, negative 12 times negative 3 is positive 36. And technically, the minus 0 like doesn't matter. So the y is just negative 12x plus 36. This is mx plus b format. The m is negative 12 is the slope, which makes sense because that's what it was before. And the b is the y-intercept, so the y-intercept in this problem is equal to 36. All right, that's a lot. Let us know if you have any questions. Um, and if you do the problem set, it follows um, these examples. So follow the examples when you're doing your problem set.